And uh, the headline at this hour is you spoke to Quinesha Johnson right after the sentencing. Julia, what did she have to say? Spoke to her for the first time, Ted, because even though she was sentenced to five years confinement, she is out on bond pending her appeal. So we got to see her walking out of the courthouse with her children, with her family. Uh, they've been upbeat when they go into the courtroom every day, but today was a different kind of relief, a different kind of happiness from those family members. And here's what she had to say about those who've been watching this trial and how she feels about everything that happened. I'm not looking for this life. Mm -hmm. uh, the family has been here for me every supported. day. Yes, a lot of them came from Philadelphia. It's, 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 it's sad. I mean, they say people show no remorse. It's, I'm very remorseful. Just because I don't sit there and tear, tear, cry, and I can't cry on cue. I'm mentally disturbed. I'm disturbed and whole, you know. I'm, I can't get stressed enough. Like, I don't mind saying that, but I still sit with baby. What would you change about that night if you could go back? What I would change? I mean, I had nowhere to go, but, you know, if I could have got my kids to left, which I was aiming to do. Um, I don't really think that there's anything else that I could have changed. You know, that was my home, my kids was in there, all I want to do is retrieve my kids. Johnson also said she wishes that the police had done more that night, and that's something that her honor, Judge Morris, mentioned as well when she was sentencing, that these officers didn't protect her and they didn't protect DeMonte Smith that night. Hmm. Yeah, what a case uh, it, it uh, is, still is. Uh, you spoke to Michael Sterling, her attorney. We watched him front and center throughout this trial, arguing with uh, just such passion. Uh, what did he have to say, and what about these, uh, the appeal, if you will? Um, uh, that, I assume, is going to be something he'll, uh, he'll start working on fairly quickly. Fairly quickly, within the next 30 days, he said he's first going to file that motion for a new trial with the same judge. And if that motion for a new trial is denied, then they go to the appellate court. The judge mentioned that 911 call that was made in 2018 by an ex-girlfriend, the one who didn't appear, who the defense wanted to bring into the courtroom. And they have accused the victim's family of potential witness tampering. He said that could be a big issue on their appeal or in their appeal. But I asked him about how how rare it is and whether it's really rare for him to have a client out on bond after they've been sentenced to time behind bars. Take a listen. This is the first case I've ever handled personally where it's actually happened. Uh, so you don't see it happen a lot, but you know, what Court TV knows and what your viewers know, what the judge knows, what the ju jurors did not know, was that we were looking for a mi missing witness that was critical to our case. I don't know if that played into the judge's decision, uh, but the judge knows we were looking for a missing witness that was critical to our case and that the family of the decedent uh, in this case had been in touch with that missing witness, had talked to her, to her had spent time with her. Uh, and so the judge knows that. And I don't know if that played at any into her mind, but obviously that's going to be an issue that's going to be important for me to raise on my motion for new trial. Keep in mind, in this case, the victim's family and the prosecution were asking for 30 years behind bars for this defendant, and with much of that being uh, something that would not be served on house arrest the way the defense asked for and did get a significant portion, Ted. Uh, it's uh, yeah, um, very rare you see someone not being remanded into custody after, uh, first of all, being convicted. Uh, but now after the um, sentencing, for sure, we I uh, just figured we'd see her in handcuffs and being carted off to the Department of Corrections. Not the case. Uh, we also heard, though, before that, a lot of emotion from the victim family impact on both sides, especially DeMonte's mother. Right. We first heard from his sister, who said that her brother was her anchor. He was her rock in this really confusing world, that uh, he was someone who really loved Quinesha Johnson, that he was head over heels, was always telling his family about her, how lucky he was to be with her. And then his mother spoke. She had a really poignant victim impact statement where she explained to the judge her son is not the monster that he was painted as by the defense. You took his life and said bye. You showed no remorse for him. None. 
<laughs> not for me, not for my daughter, not for his kids. I can't believe that I feel sorry for you for a moment. But I didn't know all the facts. I didn't know everything. I have no remorse for you. I have no empathy because you had no remorse for my son and you showed no empathy for him. You deserve every single year they can give to you. And Bernetta Campbell left early during that sentencing hearing. She heard the beginning parts of what the judge was saying, and it seemed that she didn't want to hear any more, especially when there was the discussion of the house arrest for the portion of this sentence that Quinesha Johnson is going to serve. So it's clearly been very difficult for them to sit through and hear all of these facts, and especially the portrayal she said today of her son during this trial. But uh, we did offer her an opportunity as well, Ted, to speak to us. Uh, uh, she did not not uh, come to this area to speak, but really speaking uh, more than we've heard throughout this trial from her during that victim impact statement. Yeah, uh, very sad all around. This is a difficult case. It has been, um, boy, Julie, thank you for your coverage of this uh, case over the past week plus.